he was supposed to be here, but uh, uh, COVID uh, got in his way. Um, Dan is uh, Dan Lainervos is uh, uh, a lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Southern California. Uh, his work explores nation building as a practical organizational accomplishment. Specifically, uh, Dan's research examines examines the organization of, of ties linking uh, national movements with diaspora communities. His book, Seniors of the Nation. Construction, constructing Irish and Zionist bonds in the United States appeared in uh, uh, 2013. It is the winner of the Viviana Zelizer Brook Award of the Economic so uh, Sociology Section of the uh, ASA, the American uh, Sociological Association. That is going to speak about playing the nation, constructing cultural revivals in the Irish and Jewish diaspora. Dan? Hi, everyone. Well, Can you hear me? There we are. <laughs> uh, first, I want to say I'm really sorry for not being able to join you in person. Um, I guess we are not completely over COVID. Um, and thank you for allowing me to participate uh, over Zoom. And I want to uh, add a little bit of a small uh, apology for every one of you. Um, I, I was hoping to see you in person, to meet you in person. Uh, and now I'm talking with you in Zoom, and I know like it is so taxing to listen to a flat screen. Uh, I apologize for that, uh, but I hope you'll be able to kind of extend your attention. Um, and thank you again for, for allowing me to do that. Uh, let me pull up my screen. children every day in orientation that gives people a sense of belonging. The focus on how individuals make sense and use ethnic national categories, however, obscures the organizational work that make these categories relevant everyday situation. The work on symbolic ethnicity kind of help and suggest that individuals choose between ethnic categories on the basis of their relative attractiveness and distinction. But it, it leaves the question open as to how do specific ethnic categories become attractive and distinct in specific situations? In order to address this question, uh, I will address this, uh, this at the meso level and study, the, study how ethnic entrepreneurs organize ethnic occasions. The two specific settings that I'm going to examine are, is the creation of a Gaelic Athletic League in New York and a Jewish American summer camp in the Oklahoma Mountains. My analysis centers on diaspora projects, and uh, I treat the diasporic setting as a strategic research site. Unlike the nation state, where the nation is already woven into everyday life, in the diaspora, instilling ethnic dispositions require intense organizational effort, and I'm like, this is my empirical matter. I'm looking on this empirical organizational effort. To overshow, kind of overshadow my argument a little bit, I, here it is. First, ethnic groups and nations, I will argue, are not imagined, but lived, embodied, represented, and materialized. And I thank uh, Michael Skay for putting it really succinctly and nicely. Second, there are concrete organizational me mechanisms that generate friendly rivalry and solidarity between the groups that make up the nations. And finally, 
internal differences are not just the obstacles that national entrepreneurs seek to minimize or imagine away, but when properly handled, they can play a productive role in nation building, nation or ethnic building, ethnic group building. Let me start with the discussion of what is an occasion. My analysis here borrows from Irving Goffman's work. Daniel, I did not expect you to mention him too. Uh, we typically think about Goffman as a quintessential microsociologist, but he did offer a compelling anal analysis of larger, larger scale formations. A social occasion is a wider social affair or event bounded in regards to time and place and typically facilitated by fixed equipment. A social occasion provides a structuring social context in which many situations are likely to form, dissolve, reform, while patterns of conduct tend to be recognized as appropriate and often receive official or intended work. In this sense, occasion serves like some sort of um, the, that type of place where large-scale historical structures, like nationalism, for instance, get funneled into everyday experiences. I am specifically interested in occasions that give rise to focused interactions between participants. When I'm talking about focus interactions, we are talking about organized occasions that sustain uh, focused, that sustain the interaction by imposing certain rules of irrelevance and rules of transformation. By rules of irrelevance, uh, Goffman means a certain set of factors that participants should ignore in an interaction. The example that he gives is the, in a game of chess, for example, that is a kind of create intense focused interaction, uh, the participants are not supposed to comment on the specific material that the pieces are made from, uh, you know, wood or, uh, or plastic. It is simply something that competent participants should ignore. Uh, and rules of transformation determine which factor, which, which exogenous factor will be admitted and exactly how. It is useful to think about these rules of transformation and rules of irrelevance as a type of membrane that kind of shields the interaction and determines what will stay out, what will get in, and under what conditions, and what modifications. When, and the importance for the buildup of solidarity is that when participants accept and follow the rules of irrelevance and the rules of transformations, focused interactions generate a solidarity and some sense of belonging among participants. And my modification to this Goffmanian framework is to talk about ethnic occasions or national occasions. An ethnic occasion is a social affair or event or event that is bounded in regards to time and place and typically facilitated by fixed equipment. It is designed to generate a sense of ethnic and national belonging among participants. As an organized affair, Ethnic occasions tend to have internal differentiation, some physical ex equipment and location, and some sort of endogenous interactional mechanisms. I hope that all of these points will become a little clearer just in a few minutes. My method of comparison uh, differs actually quite significantly from the linear causal model that we are used to in uh, historical sociology. The typical comparisons that we do in sociology are comparing two or more similar cases with different outcomes with an eye for those variables that explain different outcomes between them. One of the limits of this approach is that it allows us to compare 
only apples and apples. I read Bobo from Jeffrey Heidel's work on a, a different type of comparative model that he calls the iterated problem solving. The principle here is to take two or more organizational settings where actors, key actors, entrepreneurs, if you like, are grappling with more or less similar questions and following them very closely in order to understand what kind of mechanism, what kind of uh, practices they build up in order to overcome the problem. A big advantage of this approach is that it allows comparing uh, cases that are really apples and oranges. Uh, and also, because we are focusing on actors and how they solve problems, we get a very open-ended, inductive, and actor-centered actor approach. For me, the question that I will deal with is how Irish and Jewish ethnic entrepreneurs sought to generate solidarity and belonging in the United States in specific organizational settings. Let me start with the problem. In July 2nd, 1904, a group of organizer, organizers formed the Irish County Athletic Union. Maurice Dolling, the secretary of this organization, explained that through the ICAU, men from the north will meet the south, men from the south, from the east will meet the west, and a fact will be set down in history, reminding us of our glorious day. The ICAU, he explained, is not organized merely for sporting purpose, but to bring more closely together with the Irish people on the side, on, the, on this side of the Atlantic, in order to defend and uphold that which is often, too often, denied. A little less than 40 years later, Shlomo Schrusinger, a key activist in the Union of Hebrew Youth, a small organization, and a dedicated educator, identified a different problem. Thinking about Jewish education in the United States, he said that it endows the child with knowledge about the religion uh, of Israel but fails to materialize this knowledge in everyday life and fulfill the commandment, Vachai thou shalt thou shall live in you. In order to solve that, he declared that Masad would, would consolidate the spiritual, spiritual possessions that do not find full expression in the Hebrew school and give him world of cultural wholeness and harmony. Part of the problem with Jewish education is their denominational structure, torn between both focused on religion and torn in different denominational structure. They fail to give this kind of wholeness that he was trying to create. Obviously, the, the differences between these projects are huge and they're quite obvious. But there is something that holds them together. An attempt to create a place, some sort of place, where belonging, ethnic belonging, if you like, would make some intuitive sense in the United States. How do they go about doing that? Let's start with the English, Irish case. We are talking about Gaelic sports. Gaelic sports are part of the Irish invented tradition. In the United States, immigrants from England Ireland played Gaelic football and hurling in Celtic Park in Queens for a couple of years already. The games were usually played on Sunday picnics that were organized by county-based associations that I will call date holders. These date holders would purchase or rent the park for a Sunday and organize their game. The ICAU tried to be some sort of governing body that will generate and or regulate the relationship uh, between games in order to create an inclusive and friendly rivalry among teams.
following that, I'll tell you a, li a little bit about the structure of this uh, project. Following the GA in Ireland, the ICAU limited participation to county teams only. They scheduled two, two football games and one hurling game for every su Sunday. Early in the seasons, again, following the model in Ireland, teams were supposed to play against each other at the provincial level, and the winners later in the season will go up to a tournament that will lead to, a, to an elimination tournament, tournament leading to a final. In terms of transformation rule, like in Ireland, they adopted only county teams, and they also adopted important elements from the structure of the league um, to go into the, uh, the league in New York. In terms of the rules of irrelevance, team quality was not supposed to play any role, any playing, any role in the match. At the beginning, things looked good. By 1906, more than 30 teams organized in order to play those games. But regulating the game would to be very, very difficult. First, due to delays in starting time, the hurling game usually was either cut short or canceled altogether due to the encroaching darkness. Second, the big four, as they were known, that is, the four teams that had fairly strong players and very big fan base, refused to play other weaker teams. And even when they agreed to play other weaker teams, it resulted in dull and uninteresting games. As a result, most of the dull of the date holders, the people that, the organizations that actually paid for the park, uh, decided to exclude the weak teams, and the result was exclusion, of course, but also repetitive games week after week. Another problem had to do with the regulation of the game itself, not of the league, but the game itself. First, the referees, out of bias or sometimes ignorance, or sometimes people do mistake, sometimes accorded a point to the wrong team. The problem was exacerbated by the fact that the goal, that the goal cage did not have a, a, a net behind it. In Irish, in Gaelic sport, the goal has an H shape, and it's supposed to have a net at the bottom. But the fact that it didn't have a net at the bottom sometimes created a undue commotion. Then you, have, then you have two minutes. You have two minutes left. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm I sorry. I'm sorry to see you. I will try to change the things, but I'm sorry. I will be. Yeah, I probably you didn't see that. <laughs> the disputes over scoring sometimes deteriorated into brawls. In the second half of the game, something besides football took place. The throwing caused a little unbuilt commotion, and when, uh, before one, before one could say Jack Robinson, this war, worthy chap, planted a resounding right-handed in the neighborhood of the linemen's upper lip. Sometimes the police had to be involved, lending, in effect, lending credit to the stereotype of I of the Irish as rowdy and unworthy. The first attempt to resolve that problem had to do with the place itself, with the physical location of the home. <coughs> From the ICU's perspective, the problem was Celtic Park itself, which the owner rented to the highest bidders and refused to enforce their league schedule. In order to solve that, they did the, the result to buy a separate uh, field in Wakefield. However, this attempt became a complete fiasco. The Wakefield in, Wakefield in Yonkers was not well served by public transportation, and as a result, 
then simply refused to come. In the financial breakdown that followed from this fiasco, another governing, governing body was created, the USGEA, and in the absence of term and schedule, the date holders again hired only the big four teams and excluded everybody else. In the following seasons, the commentator in the Irish American Advocates lamented about certain disinterestedness became painfully evident. Each player lost, become lost not only to the GEA, but to Ireland itself. And can, can you wrap it up and... Uh... I will wrap it up, I will finish up with the Irish case and simply... Thank you. Uh, I Sorry. didn't realize that uh, I'm running so much over time. I will wrap up the Irish case and, and it will take me two more minutes or so. Wow. <laughs> Seeking a solution, in 1914, a new government, governing body succeeded the ICAU and came up with a new plan, with a new program. The GAA New York, a new organization, would form senior and junior football leagues by taking Kilkenny, Cork, and Kilgar, the big four, and two other teams into their fold. The idea there was to create a hierarchical structure uh, that deviated markedly from Ireland, but in effect, by creating a senior and a junior league, you can avoid dull matching between very strong and very weak teams while assuring broad participation. It also provided some rationale for differential payment between the teams. The nets that were placed behind the nets were also important. They saved a lot of trouble and eliminated disputes and brawls. In the following years, it is not that everybody was super happy with the arrangement that the GAA, GAA New York created, but effectively they managed to absorb enough teams such that when other teams, even big four teams, opted to play outside of the league structure, they did not have equivalent teams to play against, and they did not have enough people to invite them to their games. So effectively, the, the league managed to establish the monopoly over the play of the sport, and the Irish American can advocate celebrated that not since the invasion of Gales in 1888 as hurling and football had so strong a hold under Sterry Banner. All that was needed of the teams was to give a clean exhibition which would make decent Irishmen feel proud of their national pastime. Hmm. I will jump to my conclusion, and I apologize for that. It's really bad time management. Let me say that one thing that we can see here is that nation and ethnic groups are not just imagined, but they are lived, played out, and they are played out in ethnic occasions, in these organized, mid-level, mid-sized events. Practical organizational procedures and the physical arrangement serve as some sort of scaffolding that enable a ethnic-focused interaction to unfold uh, and create this sense of belonging and pride. And perhaps most importantly, from my, from my perspective, is that internal differences, in this case, internal differences between different teams and rivalries, are not just obstacles that national entrepreneurs seek to imagine away, but, can, but when properly imagined, they can play a productive role in nation building. Then the common trope in talking about uh, nation building is to talk about this kind of unifying thrust of saying we are one. I think what I'm, and this we are one, this ability to make sense of your belonging in 
general oh it's obviously important but it is also important to see that typically nation building project also provides some sort of organizational structure that help people make sense of i am different from within the structure of the nation thank you Okay, thank you so much. I'm afraid we don't have time for much uh, discussion. I want to say something and then we'll move, up to, move to the next speaker. Uh, I think it's very important that you showed how, I mean, we speak here about nationalism and, uh, and I think that the discussion of diaspora groups uh, shows the, how much sometimes uh, territory is insignificant when it comes to, uh, to the building of, of groupness. Uh, including nationalists or national uh, national groups, and uh, and I think I'm afraid we'll, that that will comment will do for the discussion. Uh, then, uh, but we'll have the I mean we have then uh, we'll, we have then emails and and we can if you have comments, please feel free to convey to him. So thank you so much, Dan. Uh,